This video is going to take you through the class overview for Algebra 2. Hopefully it'll answer any questions that come up as you're looking at your syllabus for this course, but certainly if you have additional questions after viewing this presentation, please reach out to me so that I can address any questions or concerns that you have. So without further ado, let's uh, take a look at some of the contact info. So welcome to Algebra 2. I hope that you are set to have a fantastic year mathematically and that you can access all the supports that are available for you so that you can have a wonderful year. I am Miss Taylor, a couple of facts about me. I am not from Florida, I am from Massachusetts. I don't think I have much of a Boston accent. Most people cannot tell where I'm from, but every once in a while it does come out, like I might tell you to sit in your chair and you'll realize that I have said chair kind of um, funny. Uh, that is because of where I am from. I am an avid runner, and so a lot of the things that I do around school or that I'll talk about in class have to do with uh, my running. I coach Marathon High at Atlantic Coast. I also belong to a local running club. The photo to the left there is from my third marathon this past February. And this is my 12th year at Atlantic Coast. I've been at Atlantic Coast since the second year the school was open. So I've been here quite a while and I've taught Algebra 2, I think, all of the years that I've been here. Um, but that, that we're getting up to a lot of years. <laughs> so um, I, d I definitely have a lot of experience teaching Algebra 2. And hopefully that will, that will be an asset as we head into the new school year. So what is my contact info? I mentioned if you have questions at the end of this presentation to reach out to me. So first contact always, always, always is the school email. So school email template is last name followed by first initials. So for me, that's Taylor R. Make sure there's no number at the end of that. There is somebody else who works for Duval County who has the same name as me. Um, and so we get each other's email a lot, but please try not to email her, okay? At duvalschools.org, that is going to be the absolute best way to get in touch with me. If you email me and for whatever reason you do not get a response within one or two days, please follow up once in a while the email will end up in the spam folder. Uh, typically, if you're emailing from your personal email, if you email from your school email, that is not usually a problem. You can also reach out to me via, uh, through text message via Remind, and you can also post in our team on Teams. So, um, and what I would encourage you to do if you are going to post on Teams to, to reach out to me, um, that's good for certain things, uh, but tag me. So just like you would tag somebody on social media, you can tag people on Teams. And what that does is it triggers a notification for me uh, so that I it like kind of, you know, the little bell goes off and there's um, less chance that I will miss it. A Remind is great for quick questions. I will use Remind for quick little reminders. And if you have more detailed questions, certainly email is the best way. And email is my preferred way for you to contact me. All right, let's go into the supply list. So math is a pretty straightforward class. There's not a lot that you need to have, and I am not a picky person when it comes to what kinds of supplies you have. So you need a notebook, any type of notebook. So I know some teachers are really picky about they want you to have a three ring binder or they want you to have a composition notebook. I don't care. Um, you know, you guys have been in school long enough that you likely have a preferred way of managing your notes. And so whatever that preferred way is, is totally fine with me. Just make sure that you have a notebook dedicated to math. Um, you should not have Spanish notes or history notes or science notes in the middle of your math notebook. And while for some of you, this is going to sound like it goes without saying, but you should begin your notes at the beginning and work from like front to back. Okay, so your notes in your notebook should not be all over the place where you have, like you just find a page. Um, and some students will do that. They'll open up their notebook to a page 
and write the notes for that day and they don't actually know where that page is and it might not be related to any other pages in their notebook. So you need to have a notebook. You need to have a folder or some system for managing handouts. And those handouts can be anything from study guides to project handouts, information about you know grades, whatever I might hand you. Okay, um, you need to have a place to put it. It should not just go into your, you know, the abyss of the, the backpack. Uh, and I don't care what that system is. Uh, I actually just saw a, a post for Trapper Keepers. I, I don't know if it was a real post online about Trapper Keepers, but um, <laughs> they were like really big when I was in elementary school. Uh, but it could be any kind of folder, any kind of binder, you know, whatever works for you. And if you don't have like a notebook or a system that you've found works for you at this point, please reach out to me. Um, just ask me for some suggestions. I know what worked for me when I was in school and that's probably what I would recommend to you and it's worth a shot. You also need to have some kind of handheld calculator that is not your phone for in-class tests. Now I am going to be using a lot of Desmos in the class this uh, year. And I do want you to have the Desmos app on your phone because it's gonna give you access to a graphing calculator on your phone. And that same calculator is embedded in a lot of the high stakes tests that we have. Um, but for in-class tests, I don't want you on your phone because your phone is a handheld computer. And so you need to have some kind of handheld calculator that's not on your computer and not on your phone that you can use for testing in class. So make sure that you get a hold of, of one of those. Um, scientific, preferable. Um, and if you have questions at all about whether whatever calculator you have is a good calculator, you know, please let me know. Um, I have a limited number of calculators that I can lend out. And so what happens is if we have more students without calculators than we have calculators, we end up having to trade off and you might have to wait for it. It's just, it's a mess. Okay. So, so, and I can't guarantee that like every single person's going to have all the time they need with one. So please try to get your hands on a calculator. They're not expensive. You can get a scientific calculator for about $10. All right. Um, what next? Class expectations. So be present and on time. Be present in class. I can't teach you if you're not here. Um, so be in the room, be on time. Um, and you'll notice a, a little bit further down, like tardies are enforced in this class. So I, you know, we have the school policies for students coming in late. Um, I very much enforce that. So if that tardy bell has rung, and then you come to my door, I am going to hold my hand out to you and ask you for a pass. Um, okay, so make sure that you have that pass when you come if you're going to be showing up after the, the bell. Bring your supplies with you, bring your notebook, um, bring any notes that you have, bring things to write with and bring your completed assignments. So have your supplies and how you organize that is completely up to you. So I know a lot of students have like an A day backpack and a B day backpack or, um, but whatever you need to do. Now be careful with like A day, B day stuff because if you come for tutoring and it's not a day that we have class, then you need to bring those supplies to tutoring and you just need to remember that you have them. Um, I would strongly encourage you to utilize the resources on your phone. Um, use the calendar um, option on your phone, set reminders. I set reminders all the time on my phone um, because I forget stuff. So if you're going to come to tutoring, set yourself an alarm or a reminder the night before to make sure that you bring your math stuff to school with you that day, but bring your supplies with you. Um, I also expect you to check your grades and your school email three times per week. And the three times got a little bit, like it's a little bit hard to see there, but check your grades and your school email at least three times per week. Um, you have the amazing capability of knowing what your grade is in real time. You, you can actually peek into my grade book and, and see how you're doing. When I was in school, that was not a thing, okay? It wasn't even a thing you could do. So make sure that you're doing it. Um, and then notify me if anything doesn't look right. And every quarter, somebody will contact me at the end of the quarter about an assignment that was due two months prior. 
and none of us remember what was going on two months ago. So when you're um, checking your grades, you notify me like, hey, I turned that assignment in um, or hey, I need to schedule that test um, and, and we can take care of those things. And then the last one is be proactive when you're absent. Uh, so not that long ago, if you were absent, there wasn't a whole lot you could do to stay up to date with your, your schoolwork while you were absent. Um, that changed and it changed a lot during the pandemic where a lot of the resources for your classes now became available online, whether it's um, video lessons, copies of handouts, um, submitting your work digitally, like you don't actually need to be present in the classroom in order to turn your homework in. Um, be proactive. Proactive means acting before there is a problem rather than reactive, which is acting after there's a problem. And so I understand that sometimes when you are absent, um, there's not a whole lot you can do. If you are very sick and you are sleeping all day, okay, then you're probably not going to be up to, to watching math lessons. Um, I know I've had students get stuck in airports or be in the hospital or like, I do understand that there are some things that like you just can't manage the school work while you're out. I also know that some absences are due to like having an orthodontist appointment <laughs> during class and your, your parents have to call you out. You, you just miss class for that uh, or to due to a field trip or something and you're not actually sick um, and you, unable to, to do your work. So if you're missing, you know, the, every situation is a little bit different, but when you're absent, you know that there is class happening, there's a lesson being taught, there's a test being given, something is happening in class when you're not there. So know what the resources are and take advantage of those resources. Make sure that you are being proactive and you're not letting that absence pile up. If you miss multiple classes and your approach to that is, well, I'm absent, therefore I don't have to do anything, um, you can end up just digging a huge hole for yourself. So, you know, and if you have extenuating circumstances, I need you to let me know, but do your best to be that proactive student, find out what's going on and take care of that stuff before it's an issue. All right. Tech requirements. So what do you need for this class? Now, this is not entirely complete. I am recording this video in July. So I'm missing some of the information, but I, I will have it by the time school starts. So I'll make sure I have it all on a handout. But what do you need technologically for this class? Well, you need textbook access and an account. And at the moment, I actually do not have an account. So I can't give you information about how you're going to have an account. But again, by the time we meet in, in August, <laughs> we'll have that information. But the textbook is online unless you have an accommodation for a print textbook. And that is handled by the book room. But for most of you, your textbook access is going to be completely online. So you need to make sure that you have access to that. When I assign you something, you will need to, to go in on a device and log in and find what your homework is. You will need a formative account. Formative is an online testing platform that I use for your at home portions of the test. So every unit test is going to have a part that you do in class. I was mentioned that earlier with the calculator. And then there's going to be a part that you do at home or on your own time. I guess you don't have to like be at your house, but uh, on your own time. And that part is open internet, open notes, um, really getting into some of the critical thinking and analyzing kind of questions. Um, there will be questions that come from your notes, like strictly from your notes to hold you accountable for for that, but you need to have an account so that when those tests go live, you're able to, to participate. Um, a Desmos account. I do hope to use Desmos this year. I did some training over that earlier in the summer. And so uh, you can do that without an account, but it gets very messy. And the big drawback to not having an account is that if you get interrupted midway through the Desmos activity, you actually have to start over again. So that's not the greatest. But if you have an account, you can like log out and log back in. You will need to have access to Remind. Remind is that text messaging app. Um, it, but you don't have to download the app. You can just use it through um, text messaging, which is fine. 
Uh, and that is like a quick way to get a hold of me because it's going to go to my phone. And it's a great way for me to get a hold of you because it's going to go to your phone. And most of us are with our phones most of the time. I know you can't see me, but my phone is sitting here to my right. It's like to the right of my elbow on my desk. And so it's, it's a very efficient way. Um, I don't use Remind a lot, but it is really useful when there's something urgent. Like I have to post my grades and I have a question about an assignment that you did. And it's for me to be able to get a hold of you. Um, right on your phone. Uh, um, that has absolutely saved students' grades before um, because like, you might not be checking your email um, regularly. And yeah. And then you will need access to the Desmos graphing calculator. And that can be either on your computer or through the app on your phone. And to kind of practice for the school year, I have downloaded the Desmos app onto my own phone so that I can practice with, with how that works. But we're gonna be approaching a lot of the content from a graphing calculator uh, perspective. And so you need to have access to that. Now you may also have a handheld graphing calculator. So if you have a TI, a Casio, I have um, a NumWorks calculator sitting on my desk in front of me. It's a different brand. It's one that most people haven't heard of. Um, but if you have that, you can actually use that on your SAT or your ACT. It's a huge asset. So if you have that, that's great, but it's not a requirement for the class because we're going to be using Desmos. So what I will have by August is the information for how to register for and access. At this point, I only know which classes I'm teaching. I don't know when I'm teaching them. I don't know when, just which ones. All right, what type of requirements, where do we go next? Grading, so how is your grade calculated? You need to pay attention to this because not every teacher does it the same way. <laughs> and so you need to know how your grades work because how your grades work drive the decisions that you make in terms of like recovering your grade or if you're absent and you accumulate like a, a, a small, let me just make it small, body of missing work, how do you recover from that? And that's where this becomes important. So looking at the point system. So this class is graded on what's called a point system. There are two main systems for the ways that your teachers can grade you, and they are very different. Um, one is a point system. The other is a weighted percentages, which can sometimes mess with students because it does unpredictable things. But um, weighted percentages is where you have different categories in your grade. Like you might have tests, you might have a labs, you know, um, reading assignments, whatever. And then each of those categories is weighted a certain amount. So if you have a teacher that says quizzes are worth 15% of your grade, tests are worth 40% of your grade, labs are worth 20% of your grade, that's a weighted percentage system. Okay. And like, it's interesting how they work. Um, I do not grade that way. So I grade on something called a points system, and that is more straightforward, I think. Um, your grade is basically the number of points you earned divided by the number of points available. And so in a given quarter, if we have 450 points available and you earn, I'm making up numbers on the spot here, that's not dangerous at all. Um, <laughs> If you have uh, 300, you get 325 points out of the 450 that were available, that is 0.72 or a 72%. And so when you're looking in focus, everything is going to have like a numerator denominator for the points. So you want to look at the points, not necessarily the percentage. Um, so at the end of the quarter, like, let's say we have 450 points and those points can come from tests. They can come from the at home tests. They can come from activities. We do, they'll come from homework. Um, you have 450 points and you earned 325. Then you would end the quarter with a 72%. And it's important to, to look at that because focus will tell you, like, say, um, let's say you get a homework assignment you get four out of 10 on the homework assignment. Focus is going to tell you 40%. And sometimes students will really freak out over that 40% um, because it's an F. But when you look at the points, you actually only lost six points. 
So six points out of that 450 isn't that significant. It's like getting a, like if you got a 94 out of 100 on a test, like you'd be happy with that, but it's like still the same six points. Okay, so um, you always want to look not just at the grade you got on the assignment, but what were the points available on it? Because what does this mean? Assignments with more points have a greater impact on your grade. All zeros are bad for your grade, but not to the same extent. And so, like I mentioned earlier, that 40%, sometimes students will really get upset because there's a homework assignment with a 40%. Well, sometimes that happens. Sometimes a homework assignment was long or it was difficult or you had to work really late and you didn't turn in the whole assignment and you end up with this four out of 10 on a homework assignment. It's lousy, but it's a small grade. If you got a, a four out of 10 on a homework assignment or you got a 40 out of 100 on a test, Technically, that's the same percentage, but the 10 and the 100 are weighting the grades differently. Okay, and so when you are looking at focus, you want to keep a couple of things in mind. One is like the score that you got on the assignment, but you have to look at how much the assignment is worth. Um, because what will sometimes happen is students will spend, they'll get to the end of the quarter and they'll get really upset over grades that are low but they don't actually impact the grade that much and they'll scramble to do work and they're they're like but wait my grade only went from a 51 to a 55 well that's because you were working on small assignments and what you needed to do was you needed to like work on the big assignment like you you didn't take a test <laughs> so um so really keep that in mind and just um a word don't throw your points away so remember that like it's, it's total points earned divided by the total points available. And so you don't want to throw points away. You don't want to get too stressed out over small deductions because we are all human and sometimes things happen. So you might have that one assignment that's like a four out of 10 and, and you don't want to blow that up into something really, really big, but small deductions like that are going to add up if they happen too often. And sometimes I'll have students that will take a late penalty on every single homework assignment. Well, one late penalty here or there, because again, you had like a really busy night and you, you couldn't get the homework done on time. That's not a big deal. That rarely is going to make a, a big difference in your grade. But if you're taking that late penalty all the time, that penalty is points that are taken off of that points earned. Um, for like not great reasons. So, so just don't throw those points away. If you have the opportunity for extra points here or there to get like more points into that points earned, um, you wanna seize those, okay? Seize those opportunities and don't forfeit questions. Like every question on a test is points available. Try to get as many of the points earned because even getting like one point out of five is better than the zero point. And you might think, well, it's only one point. Yeah, true, but like those small little things will add up if they happen too often. So you always wanna be working towards the um, getting all those points or as many of the points as you can. Safety nets. So safety nets are ways to improve or your, recover your grade. It, they go by different names. Some people will call it grade recovery. I don't really like that term. Um, I do like the term safety net. So safety net, you figure like it's uh, something that can catch you if you fall. <laughs> So, um, so we all, like I said, we're all humans and you might be like a fantastic student and we get into the second quarter this school year and it just like the wheels fall off. You have stuff going on in your family. Maybe you get sick, um, just stuff happens and you might fall. And so the safety net is safety nets are things that are there to kind of catch you. There are ways to improve or recover your grade. So what is available for you? Now, ideally, you don't want to fall. You don't want to fall into a safety net because that means like you've fallen off your high wire. Um, but if it happens, you definitely want that net there. So here's what's available in this class. All students can request extended time on assignments. So this would be requesting basically that to turn in something late with no penalty. 
Um, now, some of you have an extended time accommodation and I'll give you information about like how that works if you have that accommodation, but I'm making this available to all students. You can request to have additional time on assignments. Now, I may or may not approve your request. So if you are requesting time because you just mismanaged stuff, like I stayed up till 3 a.m. playing video games and I didn't do my math homework, I am denying your request for extended time. But if you have, you were like in a car accident, which of course we don't wanna have happen, but it does happen. If you were in a car accident and, and it scuttled your whole afternoon and you had to you know, get a ride here or there, you, your parents wanted you to go to the doctor, get checked out, and you didn't get your homework done, I would probably approve your request for extended time on an assignment. Um, so there's like a little form that is available to all students if you're not turning in something on time you're going to turn in the request for extended time on that assignment. So, so if you do have something going on, um, you can request to have that. Just keep in mind that I reserve the right to deny it if I think that you're taking advantage of it or that like your, your reason is silly. Um, all right. Late work is accepted for a limited time with a penalty on it, and that is available to everyone as well. So even if I deny your request for extended time that you can turn it in without the penalty, you can still turn the stuff in. It's just it's going to have a penalty on it. Think of it as like your credit card company charging you interest on your credit card. OK, um, so I'll still accept it but there'll be a penalty on it and it's for a limited time. So we are not turning in work uh, in March that was due in January. Okay. That's like called not being nice to your teacher. So please don't do that, but you can turn in your late work. Um, I do offer retakes. Um, there are a couple of of caveats with the retakes. One is that the second score is the score that's going to count. Okay, um, so yeah, there's actually like three. First of all, like you only qualify for a retake if you if you scored below a 70. Um, so anybody who gets an A, B, or C, like you you don't qualify for a retake. Um, yeah, you don't qualify for a retake because the, and we all know and maybe you are that student, like the student who has an 85 and is like, but I want an A. And um, what that amounts to is it ends up with um, you know, people staying after school and then I have to grade your test again. I have to do a, I have to do a lot of work over again. So remember, this is a safety net. This is not like I did not get the grade I wanted. This is like the wheels fell off <laughs> and I'm gonna end up failing for the quarter. So you can do a retake, but only if you score below a 70, you can, um, the second score is gonna count and um, that is to prevent abuse of the retake policy. Sometimes students are like, well, I have nothing to lose, therefore I'll, I'll just do a retake. But remember what I said about when you do a retake, I have to do the work again also. And I don't mind doing that. Like I, I am willing to do that for you, but I want you to take it seriously. And I don't want somebody with a, a 64 to say, well, I wanna do a retake because I have nothing to lose. And then they get a 40 the second time and they've basically wasted their time and my time. So, um, so if that happens, you're going to, your 64 is going to go away and get your 40. Essentially what that means is study. Like if you're going to do a retake, you have to take it seriously and you're going to max out at a score of 70. So if you study really hard and you get a 87 on your retake, what's going to go in the grade book is a 70. And that is to really encourage you to do that studying the first time. Because again, this is a safety net. This is to catch you um, so that you have a, a way of recovering that grade, um, not just to like bounce you up to an A if that's you know what your goal is. Um, a couple other safety nets, in-person tutoring. Um, I typically have done Mondays until 3 p.m. And I don't see any reason why this year would be different. Uh, it, I set that aside. I try not to schedule like doctor's appointments and other things. Um, if I do have a conflict, I will let you guys know as soon as I know what that conflict is that I wouldn't be there like that particular Monday until three. And I can do Teams tutoring by appointment. So we can actually meet virtually. One thing I got pretty good at um, during the pandemic was... <laughs> doing online you know, teaching and online tutoring and stuff. So uh, we can do that as well if that works 
for you, if that works better for you, if you have transportation issues and, and such. Last year, I had students um, a couple of times that were like actually out with COVID and they were keeping up with their work from home and but had some questions and they weren't in class to go over the homework and so they said can we meet you know at 3 30 on tuesday so that I, you know we can just go over some of these homework questions and that it worked out really fine um and you know we can meet for 10 minutes 15 minutes um probably not more than an hour but um but for however long so those are some safety nets that are in place for you so that you can recover your grade if things start to get out of hand. And last but not least, how to be successful. Keys to success in Algebra 2. What are the keys? Um, I think the number one thing is stay current with the work. Stay up to date on it. What the biggest like doom and gloom thing that happens with students in Algebra 2 is they begin to fall behind thinking that there's time to get caught up and then it like kind of falls on them like an avalanche um, because math builds. So what we do in unit five is going to at least to some extent build on what we did on unit in unit three. But if you like totally checked out for unit three, it just kind of keeps following you. It's not like maybe a history class where, you know, you can move from one chapter to the next and and it, I mean, some stuff in history will do that, but um, math and foreign language are the two classes that really, really build. And so falling behind is, if, if it happens too much and too often, there does come a moment during the school year where a student might come to me and say, well, what can I do to pass the course? And the answer is at this point, nothing. Like you have fallen too far behind and you can't learn this like this fast enough, uh, this, this fast, you know, to before the end of the year. So really number one key to success is staying current with the work. Um, a couple of things. Um, this next one is an attitude. Um, don't be afraid to make mistakes. That is how we learn. And you can never out mistake my patience as long as you are trying your best. Uh, with the material that we have. But a lot of students kind of freeze up and will get paralyzed because they're afraid of doing something wrong. And I'm not entirely sure where that comes from. If you're afraid, like I, I, I'll think less of you. Um, let me reassure you in this video, that is not going to happen. I'm not going to think less of you. Even if your mistake is like kind of like a silly one, I make silly mistakes. I'm going to do it this year. I'm going to do it in a video. I'm going to do it on the board. I'm going to misspeak and say something. I'm going to do some, some stuff that's wrong. And um, we learn a lot from our mistakes. And sometimes the mistakes, your mistakes make me a better teacher. And I'm always interested in being a better teacher. So don't be afraid to make those mistakes. Ask lots of questions. And I do understand some of you, the thought of raising your hand in class and asking a question like that will never happen. You're never, ever, ever going to do it. No matter how many times I tell you to, you know, it's okay. I don't ask questions when I am a student in a class. So I understand that. Fortunately, though, we have lots of ways that you can ask questions and, and kind of do it discreetly. So you can post them on Teams. You can send them to me in an email. You can text me a question on Remind and say, Ms. Taylor, I am really stuck on problem four on the homework. Can you please go over it? Or um, even better, take a picture of your problem four and send it to me and say, here's my work for problem four. What am I doing wrong? Um, please bombard me with questions. I actually just responded to a social media post um, yesterday where it referenced you know, students apologizing. Like, I'm so sorry for asking this question. I'm so sorry. No, 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 no. Like, don't be sorry for asking questions. Um, I like questions. If you're engaged in the work and you're trying to understand it, um, you can't you can't go wrong with that. And um, I can gauge the class by the number of questions asked. So if we have a whole class full of students who won't ask questions, it leaves me without the feedback I need to make adjustments. And then communicate your concerns. If you have extenuating issues going on, um, it's not that I want you to have to like divulge all your family business to me. That's like some of that's not my business. 
Um, but if you try to like hide stuff and you never tell me that there's an issue going on, then I don't know what kind of accommodations you need to, to stay current with the work. Um, and so that happens every year too. I find out like after the fact that, you know, somebody was out of the country because, you know, a family member in another country was really sick and, and they never tell me anything. <laughs> So, um, and so we get to the end of the quarter and I'm like, I, I could have helped you, but you didn't say anything. So please communicate your concerns. If you feel like you're falling behind, if you feel like you're in the wrong class, please let me know, um, communicate your concerns. And the earlier you can communicate them, the better. It's so much better to have, like, if we have to have a difficult conversation to have it in you know, September than to have it in May. Uh, so please communicate your concerns with me. I promise I will, I will be nice. Okay. Uh, so, so don't be afraid of that. And that is the end of this presentation. So hopefully that answered a lot of your questions about what is needed in Algebra 2. And if you have additional concerns, then you have that contact information or wind the video and uh, send an email to me so that I can address your concerns.